Oh hey, this is Matt Fetcher from Audio Kit. Let's get started. What is up at Music Nation? Today I have an interview with the creator of Beatmaker 3. Not only is Matt a super talented developer, he's been making music apps for 10 years. As long as the App Store has been around, he's been making music apps. He's also kind, generous, and one of the best developers I know. So let's get started. For those who are new to Beatmaker 3, can you briefly explain the premise of the app and your inspiration. Yeah, so, well, hi to, to everybody and uh, thanks for, for having me. Um, so basically, Beatmaker 3 is uh, a workstation based on a, on a sampler and you can basically create a song from the really beginning to the end. Uh, so yeah, um, it's sample based. Um, it works with uh, all kinds of plugins, audio units, um, you have effects, you have a mixer, a sequencer, um, an editor, uh, and it's based on pads. And uh, also we have a keyboard. So yeah, it's a pretty complete solution. It is a complete solution. And the name Beatmaker is a bit misleading as it does so much more. It's a full-scale DAW for your iPad. You can think of it kind of like Ableton or Logic, but for iOS. It has tracks, you can sample, and it can even host plugins. And there's a vibrant community of users. Every time I turn on YouTube, I see someone else using Beatmaker. It's really inspiring. But there's a lot of great channels people can follow, like Henny the Business, who's a producer for Drake and Kendrick Lamar. And he's done all kinds of great stuff. He produces sounds all in the box with Beatmaker 3. You can see his channel for inspiration. There's Beatmaker the Squad, there's Shazam, the iPad producer, and so many more. Let's get to the first question from the users. Are there any notable or famous musicians or producers using Beatmaker 3 that you know of? Um, yeah, we know a couple, and actually they were um, more or less involved in the, in the beta testing when we started out. Um, we have Qbert. Uh, oh, wow. Also, yeah, really cool. Uh, he did, um, uh, you know, this, um, Scratch Vinyl, like uh, Dirk Style, and uh, we, we had a collaboration with them. We have a, a free sound pack on, the, on our sound store. Um, so yeah, Qbert and then the Automator, um, Flying Lotus used to, um, to have Beatmaker 2, we were in touch with him back then. I'm not sure about Beatmaker 3, but, uh, yeah, a couple of, uh, you know, people that we actually love and listen to. So when you realize that this kind of artist user app is like a... It's the, it's the way back. It's the way back. It's the way back. And what kind of music are you into? Your musical influences. I think from music from the, the morning into, into the evening, uh, I'm listening to all different types of music. Recently, I've been listening a lot to ambience and drum music because it helps me focus a lot when I work, you know, and there is no lyrics that disturb me. Or, uh, but, you know, I, I love electronica music. I'm a huge fan of Board of Canada, for example, and Otaker and these kind of bands. Uh, from uh, from Wart and Ninja Tunes, um, uh, yeah, and you know dub techno, jazz, uh, a bit of rock, but not not too much. Um, yeah, um, you know, if the music is good in general, I would I just pleased to listen to that. But uh, yeah, recently it was um, yeah, you can see on my Twitter like uh, uh, mostly about um, ambient and vaporwave. Uh, so yeah. And this is the most upvoted question for you from the fine folks at Reddit. Do you have any idea when or if you will release Beatmaker 3 for iPhone? So the iPhone version is definitely coming. Um, I don't have a pre precise uh, release date now uh, because we are still working on the 3.1 update for the iPad version, uh, which uh, includes some really cool workflow improvements and redesign. Uh, they are not big changes, but it really makes the workflow better and easier. So we wanted to have that first. We will make an announcement when we have uh, a clear ID when it will uh, drop. But yeah, um, stay tuned. So it's definitely coming. There's no need to worry. And that brings up a question. So what's your usage like, iPad versus iPhone? Is it worth it for developers to develop for both? Um, I can only tell from BitMaker 2. Uh, which was launched first on iPhones, which is the contrary. We went onto the iPad platforms uh, later. Um, so, yeah, it's more or less like 50-50. Uh, 
but uh, right now it tends to be more like 60% percent, uh, percent uh, users on iPads and 40 on iPhones. Some people have iPads in their own home studio, for example. Um, so yeah, it's different uh, usage of the app. So Eventually, would you like to see Beatmaker make the leap to desktop? It's already in the works. Uh, we are working on the Mac version of Beatmaker 3 because obviously at some point where you have the projects on, on your iPad or on your iPhone, at some point you want to get that into your favorite desktop workstation like Logic Pro or, you know, Live Ableton Live. Uh, obviously, we cannot compete with those big guys, like not what we want anyway. But we understand that people want to be able to get their project like on their favorite workstation and finish the work like of mastering, getting the tracks and, uh, and finishing the job there. So, um, yeah, we are working on that. And Bitmaker 3 will be coming probably as a standalone and plug-in version. I will... Uh, we, we, we gave some hints uh, of that news uh, a few months ago. Um, so it's not like a big secret, but uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's in the work and it's really interesting because uh, it's a new chain, it's a new platform. And uh, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, we're working on it. Yeah, and that's super awesome. You know, it doesn't have to be a replacement for Ableton, but it has so, many fu so much functionality and there's not a lot out there for desktop that's kind of similar. And just the ability to take, you know, a project that you work on and take it to the desktop and back to your iPad again, it's, that's, or even to your iPhone, that's really mm -hmm. amazing. You know, I use Beatmaker 3, actually made the theme song. It's the way, it's the way, it's the way back. It's the way, it's the way, it's the way back. Interview with Beatmaker. And, uh, you know, we're starting to develop, you know, AU plugin capabilities at AudioKit. Yeah, because uh, Beatmaker 3, because the code uh, for hosting actual audio units works exactly the same, almost exactly the same as iOS and Mac. So if you use the, the standard version of Bitmaker 3, you would be able to host audio unit V3 plugins also on Bitmaker 3. But at the same time, Bitmaker 3 will be able to work as a plugin for other hosts and uh, DAWs. Um, so yeah, we are a small team, so be with us. <laughs> <laughs> And here's a good question. If a benefactor were to give you hundreds of millions of dollars and take over all your responsibilities at Intua, what would you do? How would you spend your time? What kind of app would you build with all your free time and money? What would you build? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think if someone would take the responsibility of running you know, the development and, and stuff like that, I think I will go out and actually meet producers and artists and try to really understand um, the music industry as a whole. Uh, obviously, I don't have time to do that and, and not the, 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 like the opportunity. I cannot like, uh, plan trips all the time. Uh, so I think I will do that and try to you know, get in touch with actual people, whatever they are, like small artists or big artists, but like really try to understand how is the music production world today? And try, you know, to, to see where it could go and try to have new ideas that could help them create in a more uh, productive way or more creative way or, you know, go crazy with new things like machine learning. Recently, we've seen that Google is an uh, ancient super um, where audio meets machine learning and interface and intelligence. So, you know, there's it's a land of opportunity out there. So, yeah, taking the time to go there and, and try to see what's up. Yeah, that's really incredible. You know, and I like that you're doing it musician first versus trying to push technology on people. You're seeing how they work and seeing how you can help them with tools in the future. That's, that's really awesome advice. And so here's a kind of a fun question. If you weren't working on software and instead making music hardware, is there any hardware that you wish you would have invented, worked on, or could work on? Like modular uh, synthesizers, it's really taking off, and I'm really interested into that. I don't. I, I just have a field kit, you know. It's a really small um, modular-ish uh, um, toolbox that you can use, 
uh, I'd love to spend more time around like a little studio with a bunch of modular stuff and try to create, to learn first and try to see what's up with that and how you can make new sounds. I, I love ambient music and, you know, a drum music. So try to create this uh, really nice evolving textures. And I feel like, uh, um, like the modular world uh, would be uh, a good place to start. Yeah, yeah, modular is kind of like a drug. You know, you can't just buy one module. It's a never-ending money pit of time and space. Yeah, yeah, I see that. <laughs> you know, it kind of goes back to the earlier question about $100 million. You might be able to spend it all, you know, building the ultimate <laughs> modular. Yeah, yeah, so too much modular or spaceship. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're a pretty smart guy, and you can make music apps on any platform. Was there a turning point in the evolution of iOS where you said, okay, now BeatMaker 3 is possible, or there's some other things possible in the future? I would say that it started with uh, Audiobus. Um, th that was a tipping point because it would open like, apps to be able to communicate between the terf, which is what people wanted. Uh, and we had the idea like for a few months uh, but we didn't have time to really make that like a really small like plugging interface. And so they came out with Audiobus and and yeah, it has evolved now. And now Apple uh, made the audio unit V3 available, which is another step up. And now you can really compare. Uh, it's Well, the desktop and platform are still, you know, there they they are differences obviously, but... Audio units, yeah, definitely opens a lot more, and it's 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 great. It's great. It's really great. AUV three is uh, really amazing, and it's mm -hmm. though it's incredibly difficult from the development side for those watching and berating every single developer. When is the AUV three version coming? It's it's quite yeah. an undertaking. You know, it's audio development is one of the hardest types of iOS development. You know, I think it's harder than building like an Instagram clone or a Twitter <laughs> clone. It's kind of funny that you know audio developers make the least amount of money, and they have the hardest job. So please be nice to developers like Matt here. He's uh, really hustling and working hard for you, and he could be making probably twice as much as a consultant. You know, for anyone would love to hire him. Uh, this is a funny question. Someone uh, DM me. You don't have to answer to this if you don't want. It's to. fine. It's fine. It's WTF. Why do you keep changing the goddamn price on BeatMaker 3? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's difficult to find the good price point where we are not too greedy, we are not too cheap because we have to eat. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's difficult because the whole app marketplace, especially the music ecosystem, is... Um, it's, it's not easy. I mean, you have to really earn your place and um, an app like BitMaker Suite takes a lot of time, months, if not years to develop. So um, you have to find the right balance. And obviously you see the desktop world where prices are super, the like double or triple. Yeah, and people have to realize, you know, almost as much work goes into this as a desktop DAW. And the price is literally like 20 times cheaper and you get to take it with you and free updates. It's just an amazing deal for the consumers. If you have a price and raise it, it's a big no because, you know, um, yeah, people are not going to, you know, they will say, ah, it was uh, cheaper before. Now it's too expensive for me. I will move on. Um, even if we are talking for an app that costs like 9, 10, or 15, or 20, or 30 bucks. Um, but lowering the price uh, is something that you can do because, you know, there is plenty of times that you can offer uh, a discount on your app for an event or something like that. Though, you know, for a developer who's trying to find the perfect price for their app, let's say they don't know if it's $10, $15, or $20, is it better to start at $20 and lower it to $15 and $10, or start at $10, then raise it to $15, then $20? It's a, it's a tricky question because, you know, you can say like, ah, because it's, it's launch time. So people that really want the app, they will, they will pay for it anyway. Um, but at the same time, if you have an intro price, it's more attractive and you can like 
uh, make some complaint about that and say like, oh, it's it's uh, half price or a third of the price for um, for two weeks or this amount of time, so you can really generate a buzz around around that. Um, I think an intro price is a fair way to get more attention around your app, uh, but you should be um, explicit about the the regular price of your app, uh, which we did. Like we said, like oh, it's a fifty percent discount, so you know you are getting a fifty percent discount because if it's uh, just lowering by one buck, uh, yeah, it's not the same as uh, uh, lowering it by ten, for example. What is the work-life balance with the head app? Do you get any time off? Um, yeah, when you run a small software company, you cannot really have like normal hours because you have to take care of business more or less all the time, especially when most of your users are living from, from across the ocean. Um, but yeah, I work a lot, that's for sure, but I really like what I do, so it's fine. But you have to put... Um, like discipline into your 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 life and try to I don't know exercise be healthy go out see friends that's absolutely necessary if you want to keep good balance uh, uh, with your life because you can end up like just just working too much and and basically crash which is something you, you don't want you want to have like discipline I think it's uh, really important and um, I find this by just uh, working out. Um, you know, every week it gives me like some time to focus on 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 my body, basically, and that helps me with uh, with the brain, I guess, and uh, give me balance and it's time for me. And uh, yeah, it's it's really important. That's awesome. And so, yeah, it's really important to you know get some time <laughs> away from the computer yeah. users. So tell us about Intua. Many people think software is created by a large, giant corporation. However, you're a small indie team. How big is Intua? Is it just you or are there, are there more people involved? Yes, there is definitely more people involved. Um, we started with uh, three co-founders. Uh, we went to the same school, uh, three developers, basically. Um, so, yeah, we are uh, two main developers at the time, and we have... One community manager, which takes care of you know um, the community and support and making sure we get like um, uh, new content for the user and try to engage them around the app and things like that. Uh, we have someone in the U.S. taking care of business relation, the sound store, and things like that. And we also uh, ask for help to uh, some uh, contractors for you know all things based on. Uh, marketing and analytics and things like that which i think is necessary when you have an app like that so you can really try to understand what are what is the audience and how people uh, use the app and making sure uh, we can um you know have a comprehensive offer for them and, and and yeah but we are a small team and so you have to be prepared um i mean i guess other companies in the are in the same uh uh, kind of um, spirit like uh, indie uh, so you have to be prepared to be able to do and learn the new thing like okay what's what's uh, like what's marketing how does that work you have to really adapt and sometimes maybe you will have to uh, go into your website and change something because you know uh, it's late and you need to have something done so um, small teams mean being able to do multiple things at once yeah, there's no such thing as not my job. You know, everyone. Yeah, has exactly. <laughs> and where if it's not your job, then probably uh, nobody will do it for you. So, yeah, but it's really interesting because you get to learn new things. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, indie developers are some of the most well-versed people I've met, and they could step into any role and succeed. So that's really awesome. It sounds like you have a really comprehensive and agile team, and moving, building on that. For those watching that are inspired by your story and they're like, I'm going to start making music apps, what would you suggest to them to get started? Um, I think it's really important to, to see what's missing on the platform. Like, oh, for example, there's not this type of app and, or this app is doing it, but not in the way that it could be done or, or because obviously there is so much synthesizers and effects, um, but there is still room. 
Um, I suggest like like seeing always uh, the um, the ecosystem, and then when you have figured out your ID, don't jump right into the code. Make blueprints, make layouts, send screenshot to your iPad and try to imagine how it will work, and try to sometime be ready to ditch everything you did or your layouts and start fresh. Maybe you will find a better way to present uh, some features or, or your app. Uh, yeah, take the time to really like understand the, the app as a world and then do the coding. Because if you start with the coding and then you realize that, oh, it will be better that way and you have to ditch some code, even if it's a small part, it's uh, something you could have figured out before. So Matt is giving some really great advice. He's talking about design first um, coding. So basically you create all your mock-ups and you can actually use software to put it onto your iPhone or iPad and kind of mock up the functionality without yeah. writing a single line of code. So if you're just a designer or a musician out there looking to hire a developer, you can kind of mock all this stuff on, up on your own for free before you even spend the dime. Mm -hmm. And that way you'll know if it works before you get six weeks into it and have to start all over. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so it's really good to see this kind of um, collaboration that you can have. Like, oh, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm a designer and I want to make a uh, music app, but I know how to make the design. So we'll find out uh, a developer to help me that. So it can really both score meeting and doing something great. Uh, and you have actual, actually something to start working on. Like, this is my, my design. How, how, can, how can the coding work so I can do that? Um, but features sometimes, I mean, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I could spend like one month working on a new slicing uh, feature and maybe nobody would use it. And I remember reading an article about complex apps, like music apps basically, where are uh, maybe 80% um, of the features are never used. Most of the features that you have in an app, a complex app, will end up not being used. People will use the basic stuff they want, you know, uh, because you don't have only just power user of the app. So, yeah, uh, and th this is where analytics come into 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 the equation because you can really see, oh, this feature is never used. So maybe I would consider not redoing that if I would be making an app like that again, or maybe I would not put as much effort that I did on the other feature, or we try to improve, take more time into improving that feature that is used way more. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really important. Yeah, and Matt's advice here, it can be used for any kind of developer. You don't have to be an audio developer. Focus yeah. on the 20% of your app that most users use, because that's where the functionality is. You know, iOS devices, people want them for convenience. You know, some of them aren't spending four hours in front of it like you would a desktop. So make it easy for them to do the things that brought them to your app in the first place. And also, I feel that today you can basically teach yourself coding, especially with Swift and Playgrounds and AudioKey Pro. Um, if you are really passionate and want to make a music app, um, I think if you're motivated, you can learn how to program even if it's really new for you. It's you know, just about uh, reading and, and, and learning, which is really interesting. Um, it's worth trying out, at least. Yeah, you know, I would encourage people to try it out and you know, stick with it. It's, it can be frustrating at first. It's a lot to learn. Um, I was never a natural programmer. Uh, you know, I've been doing it my entire adult life and I'm still not good at it. But so you make it look easy. Did you consider yourself, a, you know, kind of a brainy smart kid in school? No, no, not really. Um, no, I'm a, I was just like an average uh, kid at school. Uh, um, it's just like um, I got into computers and programming at an early age. So, you know, it was kind of... Uh, really interesting at first like oh basically it started like and i think it started like like that for for many people uh in the software industry is like you know i was gifted a, a nintendo a nes uh when i was like i don't know seven or eight or something like that 
And so I used to play like these eight bit video games. And at some point I was like making little drawings and I wanted to, to be a, um, a game programmer. And so then I moved on to computers and you realize that you can code. So I remember buying like a huge C++ book, book and I wouldn't understand anything, but it was always around, you know? And uh, then I went to um, a computer science school and yeah, did that from there. Awesome. You know, do you have any marketing tips for indie developers that don't have, you know, the full-time resources that you do? What we realize is that people rely a lot on social networks. So having a presence on, on Twitter, Instagram is something to look out for. It's really fun because you will be able to interact with uh, uh, your user directly. And also you can, um, I don't know, like um, uh, showcase the new features that will be launching soon in an update or uh, having like a cool track that someone made and you can retweet that. It's pretty important to be um, aware and like social. The social um, uh, side is uh, something to push forward. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I think it kind of helps raise your visibility. Uh, for those watching, Matt is really active on social media and is very accessible. And to the point where I asked people for questions for him and I received over 100 questions for Matt. This is how popular this guy is. So he's, um, you can almost say he's a celebrity iOS music developer. I don't want to embarrass him, but he's, he's a very prominent developer and you know, he's earned it. You know, he's put in the work, he's been doing it for 10 years now and he, he makes great software. Tell us about these in-app purchases. For BitMaker 3, part of our users want um, to have access to pre-made packs because they just want to create and we try to be accessible with the, the, the price tag we have and the offer. Um, so this is something we, we always con considered. Uh, we had the Sun Store back in BitMaker 2 and it's great because, you know, you know what people want and you can design and work with artists and sound designer and make really cool stuff especially because in Bitmaker 3 you have uh, these macro controls so you can like um, uh, get packs and really tweak the sound with the macros uh, it's really good and you can offer free content also uh, to the users because you know you have to be um, um, you have to provide new content to, to, to your paid users all, all the time um, so for us, it really makes sense to have a sound store and a place that you can buy packs. And we can see like the big names of the industry shifting to that also, like native instruments uh, going that way because, and the, the machine expansions. And because, yeah, I mean, um, sound design takes time. Um, programming your own song, importing is kind of, advanced usage uh, it takes time to do that some people prefer to do that and it's uh, it's really great um, but some people just want to be productive right away so they have access to to this offer we have uh, on, on bitmaker screen yeah and these in-app purchases they sound really great and you know sound design takes a lot of time people put as much time and effort into recording and meticulously sampling as they do coding so you know, I think it's important to support that aspect of the music industry business. So do you make your in-app purchases in-house or do you work with other producers? So uh, actually both. Uh, we do our own. Uh, we have a really talented uh, person uh, taking care of that, of the sound design uh, as a professional, doing that for years uh, with uh, all kinds of modular synthesizer effects, synthesizer, you name it. Um, and also we collaborate with other artists and some designers. Um, recently we have been working a lot with uh, MSX Audio guys. They do like really awesome stuff. Um, the Fly Life Pack uh, and that are on our, our sound store. Uh, we have uh, new things coming also. Uh, so it's great because you get to work with nice sound designers in different genres of music and type of sounds. And we also have this SpaceX pack, which was pretty experimental, but the sounds were 
really amazing and you could really shape into any kind of production being like electronic music or hip hop or experimental or ambience. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's great to be able to, um, to collaborate on that and um, like put new ideas and see how people react to that. And Matt supports developers. He answers questions. He helps out uh, at AudioKit. We have a Slack group. He's in there answering questions. And you even help developers get their AUV3s working with BeatMaker 3. Mm -hmm. Don't you offer a free copy for developers so they can test out their app before they launch it to the store to make sure all the users can use their app within BeatMaker 3? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's really good to be in touch with other developers because we are in, like, in the same train, you know, so uh, you shouldn't be... Uh, um, you should respect other developers uh, and be sure that everybody, everything works because the user, what he sees is an app that can load other apps. He doesn't care if it doesn't work or it crash. Your app will crash. So, you know, it's, it's your responsibility. Maybe it's a plugin developer, maybe it's a host developer that, um, that's the problem. But um, yeah, we do provide uh, promo codes for, for, for any um, developers that want to make sure that their app work with uh, uh, BitMaker 3. We even have a separate app, the beta, uh, where you can try out new features um, that we are working on and to make sure that also their plugin works perfectly or when Apple make an update on the IUV3 API to make sure that it works and everything is fine because as I'm telling you, like the end user, it doesn't know or care about if it's the us that is crashing or if it's a plugin that is crashing. So it should be a joint effort. Yes, um, some users can be very unforgiving. So do you have any recollections of some crazy feedback or user comments you received over the years? The most recent um, feedback, a negative one, was uh, so when BitMaker 3 was, uh, was free for those four days. Uh, someone posted a review on the App Store, which was extremely harsh about the world um, UX and UI of BitMaker 3, which I can understand, but it was like really put in a really, really, really negative way. So I'm fine with negative criticism. It really helps also being real for a second, like, okay, yeah, maybe I'm not right about that. And maybe it's, there is a problem for sure. So we always accept criticism being positive or negative. Um, but yeah, some people can be frustrated because they were, you know, creating something and the app ends up doing something else or not doing what they expect. So it can come like a support question can come, can come from a frustration. So it can be harsh, but as long as you communicate and try to understand the problem and like try to ignore the, the, the bad tone or the angry tone or the harsh tone, um, once you answer, people are generally, you know, uh, willing to help you and explain the problem and then you can go from here. Um, so don't take too seriously, uh, like harsh feedback. It's part of the game. You have to be cool about that, but yeah, communication is key. Uh, it's, it's also, it's really cliche, but, uh, once you answer and not try to be harsh yourself, because if you're giving an harsh answer, you're going nowhere and the the person in front of 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 the computer will say uh, uh, yeah this is really bad customer uh, support so you don't want that you want to be uh, understanding of the situation and making sure that you help the people because they will want to do something with the app so you should be um, um aware of that that is really great advice you know as an app developer you have to have a lot of patience and really see things their way Sometimes you see a review and you know that they're doing it wrong, but you still have to, you know, be patient and try to explain and help them and help the user. And, you know, just don't let the bad reviews get to you, just like anything else in life. You got to yeah. keep pushing forward. Try to understand what's the, the message behind maybe those, uh, those angry words. Um, because, uh, yeah, in general, there is uh, like a necessity or um, like, a spike of creativity that was, uh, um, yeah, that didn't go all the way along. And so the frustration can come from uh, not be, being able to do a simple task or something like that. But once you understand that, 
it's all good. Do you have anything you want to say to people before you go? Um, yeah, I guess I would say that there is some limitation in every app on every platform, but try to see what the value is and, and try to adapt to that and just be creative with what you have and not try to see, oh, this app doesn't have this feature, so I will not be using it. Try to work the limitation and just be creative with what you have because we've seen people create full tracks, 10-minute tracks on BitMaker 1, on really old phones. And so if you could do that at the time with an iPad and a few apps, even free apps, you can go crazy and you know start creating because right now it just takes like having um, a tablet or a phone and just starts into music creation. It's way easier to start doing that right now that it was like 15 or 20 years ago where you had to invest into computers and, and audio interfaces and expensive software and stuff like that. That's awesome advice. Yeah, thanks for having me and all the interesting questions. It was a pleasure. This has been Matthew Fetcher. Thanks for watching. AudioKit is a completely free and open source project run by volunteers. You can learn more at audiokitpro.com.